That final song is so fitting uh, for us. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Fitting reminder in light of our passage this morning out of Philippians chapter 1. Please turn with me there to Paul's letter to the Philippians. We'll be continuing this morning in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Let's pray. Father, we know that everything we have, everything that we're able even to do is a gift from you. Even our faith is a gift. And we thank you for your mercy. And we humbly ask for more of it. Help me to teach your word boldly this morning with love. Let your word have its effect in each of our hearts to make us better servants of your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. So in our passage this morning, Paul exhorts the Philippians to to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, not only in their believing, but also in their suffering. By standing and striving and not fearing. And like the Philippians, Christians are called to be sanctified. We, just like the believers in Philippi, are called to live worthy of the gospel in faith and through our suffering and to do so striving together. Paul tells the Philippians here in in these verses what their faith is for and what their suffering is for. It's for the sake of Christ. It's for Christ's glory. Believers glorify Christ when they strive without wavering, in unity, without fear. And so he gives us a purpose in verse 27, what we are to do, and he gives us a path in how we are to do it in the verses that follow. So, so that we know not only what this life is for as believers, but how we are to go about it. So we have a clear mission And we also have a good map to get there. And that mission, our purpose, some would argue that the the theme or the driving purpose statement of the letter is a life worthy of Christ. Our passage this morning in in the Greek, these three verses is all one long, uh, classic Pauline sentence. It's just one driving sentence, the whole thing. And it's all uh, driven by, by this main verb that appears right in the beginning of this verse. That's all the ESV translates, let your manner of life be, is, all, is one verb, polituomai in the Greek. And it, it has to do with, with uh, the city-state. It starts with, with polit, which is where we get political. Uh, the, the word polis is the word for city in Greek. And, and so it has to do with, with the way that someone conducts their, their citizenship. And so as a noun, it means city. As a verb, it means how do you live as a member of the city? How do you live as a citizen? And so, uh, so it's, it's, it's this act of, of conducting yourself. Uh, the NASB uses conduct yourself. 
uh, as, as a citizen. And we've talked a little bit about how, how Philippi was a, a Roman colony. So these people were given Roman citizenship. There would have been some pride, some identification with, with Rome, proud to be included in Roman culture, uh, proud to, be, to, to belong in some sense to, to a, a superpower government, to the Roman Empire, proud to be privileged to all the, the rights and responsibilities of Roman citizenship. There's a natural uh, a Paul, a pride and, and identification with, with citizenship. And Paul calls on that reality with this exhortation there. He's telling them to conduct themselves as good citizens and to do so in a manner worthy, not of Rome, but of Christ. Worthy of the gospel of Christ. And in many ways, the Philippians have been doing well. They've, they've been an encouragement to Paul. The first 26 verses have been positive. We've seen he's thankful to God for the Philippians. They've been an encouragement to him, a source of joy for him, even in, in prison. But now he turns to an, an, an urgent command in this verse, the first command for the Philippians uh, of this nature to, to keep going. I used to run uh, track and field, and um, I'm not a particularly competitive person by nature, but I, I loved the, the, the battle, the grueling battle of a long-distance race and, 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 and sticking with it and see who, who had the guts to keep, to keep driving. And uh, I think a big part of why I loved it also was I had a good coach. I had a great uh, coach who, who, was, who was stern. He was exactly the kind of coach that you would want for your kids. He, he knew how to, how to drive us hard and then let up just enough to, to remind us that he really did love us and then, and then get right back to it and, and drive us to, to work hard and do well. And eventually, uh, Coach and I developed a system uh, because to run a distance race well, you have, to, you have to pace yourself. And it's pretty well established, well known, that, that to run your fastest time in a distance race, you have to keep a steady pace. If you start too fast, you'll, you'll run out of steam, you'll run out of energy, and you won't run the best race that you can. And, and if you're up and down, you waste energy with your speed, but you need to strive for a consistent pace that, that maximizes your own fitness and your own ability. And so, so we developed this system, and Coach would stand on the back corner of the track, and, and when I'd come around, he would have his clock in his hand, and he would, he would monitor my pace to see if I was on goal for the race. And if I was, uh, well, I'd come by, if he, if he said, for example, plus two, that would tell me that I was two seconds slow. I was two seconds over, and so I had, I had let off the gas too much, and I needed to dig in. I needed to keep driving. There's a long way to go. Don't let up, but keep, keep pressing on and get back on track. On the other hand, if I came by and he said minus two, it's the opposite. You're, you're two seconds too fast right now. You need, to, you need to settle in. Realize that this is a long race and it's going to be difficult. There will probably be a fight at the end and you need to be prepared for it. So cool your jets and get back on pace. And every once in a while, on occasion, I would come by my coach at exactly the right time. Exactly on pace. And my coach, I, I could see it as I was coming in. He'd kind of drop the timer a little bit and he'd look to see where my where my opponents were, and he would just kind of wave me on with his hand, and he'd give me this coachly, authoritative, go! Just go! And that meant you're on track. Don't let up. In fact, keep working harder, because it gets harder the more tired you get. Keep pressing on. Stay on track. You're doing well, but there's a long way to go. So go. And that is the nature of this letter to the Philippians. That's Paul's attitude toward them here in this command. You're doing well. I'm encouraged by you. You're on track, but go. There's a long ways to go. There's going to be a fight at the end. Any race worth running is going to be painful. It might be a fight the whole way. So keep on track. Keep going. And the way in which Christians push after the finish line, Paul tells us, is to act like citizens of the kingdom of God. 
to let your manner of life, the running of your race, be visibly worthy of the gospel of Christ. No matter the circumstances, without, without wavering, he says at the end of verse 27, whether I come and see you or am absent, Paul wants to ensure that they aren't putting any hope in Paul, that their Christianity isn't on display for Paul. Paul might come back, he might not, but our, our testimony isn't just for the people that we respect or the people that we care for or the people up front. Your testimony is not for your pastor. Your testimony is, is not just for your parents. Your Christian manner of life is not for when your spouse is around. It is hypocrisy to act more Christian for some people than for others. And Jesus will spew that kind of lukewarm Christianity out of his mouth. Because it is not, it is not for Paul, or for your parents, or for your friends. Christ knows your heart. He knows your motives. And if he's given you his spirit, he wants your behavior to be a testimony to others, your manner of life, certainly to the church, to the downtrodden, to the discouraged, to the lost. An overflow of a grateful heart, of gratitude to Christ, flowing out a testimony to your desire to please Christ because it's Christ's purpose for you. So Paul says, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, our conduct is not something to ramp up for those we respect, even someone like Paul. It doesn't matter who stands here at the pulpit. What matters is that the truth is taught. Likewise, what matters is that the church, the body of Christ, lives out a manner worthy of the truth which you've been called to, lives a life worthy of that gospel and doing so according to scripture. And so what does it mean to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of Christ? Or what is it for? Look down at verse 29 for a moment. This is the, the reason given for the command in verse 27. He says, it has been granted to you. It's not just a consequence of being alive that we are to live in a certain way, but it is rather the result of a gift from Christ. This is a charizomai. It's, it's a, a free gift. It's not just something that's uh, given in a, in a common sense, but it's a free gift, a, a grace gift it's sometimes translated. In, uh, in Romans 8.23, Paul writes, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That's the word here. It's a gracious gift. A gift you did not earn. A gift you could not earn. Bestowed by a heavenly Father because he loves you and demonstrated his love for you while you were an unrepentant sinner. It has been granted to you. What's been granted? What's, what's the nature of the gift? Paul lists two things. It's been granted to believe. Belief is this first and most beneficial gift, the gift of faith. We know that the righteous live by faith. They don't live because of their goodness, their law-keeping. We don't prove ourselves worthy of salvation by our behavior. We, we receive this gift of believing so that, Ephesians 1, verse 12, we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Our hope is for his glory because, because it's his gift to us. He's done it. Verse 13, in him Christ, that is Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to, again, to the praise of his glory. So like the Spirit, like the promise of an inheritance, like adoption as sons and daughters, our very belief is a gift from God. You were granted to believe. And, look back at verse, uh, verse 29, granted to believe and granted to suffer. 
granted to suffer for his sake. Now, we realize that suffering might be part of living in a sinful world, but granted? Can't we say no thank you to that gift? I'd like to think about the word suffer here for a minute. Slow down and look at what he means here. Remember back in verse 17, Paul talked about uh, some ill-motivated Christians, these, these believers in the church who were trying to add to his affliction. They were trying to add to his, his suffering. And, and they were trying to add, we talked about that word, to his flipsis. It was a different word that Paul used to these, these other believers who were trying to add to his pain, add to the, the weight of his chains, make his imprisonment more bitter for him. And so that, that's the word he used earlier. But here he uses a different word for suffering, and uh, it's, it's the word pasco. And I don't, I don't want to read too much into it because it is a word that's used all over, but I think it's helpful to, to look at this word specifically. The, the word, uh, the noun pasca is, is just the, the noun version of the verb, and they mean, uh, they, uh, the, the verb means to suffer. The noun means the Passover. It's the same word for Passover. So, for example, when Jesus in Luke 22 is, is sitting down to the Passover meal with his disciples, he says in, in chapter 22, verse 15, he says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And Jesus is, is using these same words. He essentially says to them, I have desired to eat this Pascha before I Pasco. I have desired to eat the Passover before I suffer. And, and so what's the, the context of the Passover meal? It's this memorial a feast that God prescribed for them that would remind them of his salvation, remind them of his deliverance from Egypt, where they had to slaughter an animal. They had to kill a sacrificial animal, and its blood would go on the, the doorposts of their house as a sign, as a, as a stand-in between them and God's judgment. And the sign of that sacrifice, of that blood, would, would, would be their salvation, would be their, their paschal lamb. And Jesus was about to become that for them. He was about to become this once-for-all Paschal Lamb, this final sacrifice. He was replacing the Passover at that meal. I've desired to eat this very final Passover with you, this final reminder before I become the Passover for you. And Jesus suffered. He bore that wrath of God when he suffered on the cross for the sake of those who were granted to believe. And now, now granted to those who are called to bear his name. And, and to Pasco, those who, to whom it's granted to suffer for his sake, for the sake of his glory, granted to suffer for Christ's name, even alongside Paul in the same battle engaged with the same conflict, Paul writes in verse 30. The same warfare of walking in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. This, this struggle of upholding Christ's honor and his, his truth and his love in a desperately sinful world. And how do we do that? What are our tools of our warfare? What are our marching orders as Christians? in this same conflict that the Philippians see Paul fighting in. This is the second division of this passage. We've seen our, our purpose here in this command from Paul that we are called to live lives that display the glory of Christ for his sake. Since we've been given this dual gift, both to believe and to suffer for his sake, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ's name, this is our purpose. And in verses 27 and 28, Paul shows us a path to walk in order to, to live out this purpose. And he highlights in these two verses three crucial aspects of, of Christian life necessary to behaving in a manner worthy of Christ. He tells the Philippians to let their manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, 
and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Paul tells the Philippians to be unified, to be persistent, and to be fearless. Or, to use the language of the passage, he wants to hear that they are standing, that they are striving, and that they are unafraid. So first, this this unity or this standing firm. Paul wants to hear that they're standing firm, he says, in one spirit, in, in in one mindset. One unity. And this first way that Paul encourages them to live like citizens of God's kingdom is, is it's to be unified and it's, it's standing firm as a, as a sort of military analogy. It's a, a, it calls to mind that the frontline soldiers who, who stand firm, who hold their ground together, knowing that, uh, that a step backward as, as a soldier who's holding the line is a betrayal. To step back when you're a soldier holding the line not only betrays the soldiers to your left and right because it makes them more vulnerable and it weakens the line, but because of that, it's a betrayal of your captain because it betrays your position and your security as, as a line. And in so doing, it betrays your own purpose. He calls them to hold the line, to stand firm in one spirit. Hold your ground in a common conviction, unified around God's word and the desire to be found faithful. Unified to stand firm against all kinds of sin. This world is filled with so much deception and duplicity and moral relativity and it seems more and more as the days go on and compromise and it creeps into the church it rides in on the backs of careless sheep it comes in the mouths of fierce wolves and we are called to be vigilant that's this language of standing firm in one mind paul writes to the Romans, making a different point, but using this same word here for standing firm, that it is before one's own master that a servant either stands or falls. Brothers and sisters, we are in a spiritual battle, and whether we stand or fall depends, by God's grace, on whether we stand together on the hope and the promises of his word. Paul was not ignorant to the enemy's creeping into the church at Philippi, seeking prominence. He already talked about earlier in the chapter, these ones who were seeing his imprisonment as their opportunity to raise themselves up. People spreading disunity and discontent we'll read more about in the chapters that follow. We cannot afford to be ignorant to the enemies in our own time, threats even to our own Church, we must stand firm in one spirit, holding up the gospel of truth and rejecting anything contrary that pretends to be true. Do not be deceived, Paul writes elsewhere. If it sows disunity and discord among believers, it is not Christ. Now, don't, 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 misunder, don't mishear me As a church, seeking after the word, we we strive and we work together to be more like Christ, to honor him better as a church. And that means that we we talk and we communicate. And I've had had so much helpful, constructive, positive feedback about, about how do we navigate change as a church. And it's good. It's good. We do that as a church. We we go to the scriptures and see how do we honor Christ better. And those are good things. But believers, if it causes, if your desires and your agenda causes discord and disunity in Christ's church, it is not Christ. If it dresses itself up, if it dresses selfishness up and calls it love, it is not Christ. If it hides self-righteous pride behind an outwardly pious demeanor. It is not Christ. 
if it whispers hate and discontent, but parades it as godly duty. It is not Christ. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. It is not Christ. If it no longer fights the good warfare, 1 Timothy chapter 1, if it no longer holds the faith or even a good conscience, it makes shipwreck of the faith, it is not Christ. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up and understands nothing. It is not Christ. We cannot merely call ourselves Christians. We must conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And praise God, we are not alone in doing that. God has graciously given us each other. If we were alone, who could stand? He's given us each other. He's given us his church, his spirit, his word, and his people are to be of one mind, standing firm, arm in arm, equipped with all the armor of God, Ephesians 6. God's truth and righteousness, the readiness of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, which is his word. This is God's armor presented to the church so that his people will be equipped to stand firm against evil. So that they will stand firm together and honor Christ in their striving. And that's the second of these, these three uh, aspects of the Christian life, this striving together. And the metaphor shifts from, from a military one to, to, uh, to uh, athletics. This word for striving is, is soon athleo. And, and you, can, you can even hear the, the word there. The soon means with. And athle, athleo, as you might, uh, you might guess already, means to, to contend, to, to struggle. It's exactly the word that we get athlete from. It's all the effort of an athlete striving to win the prize. And when you put them together, this compound word, soon athleo, it's all of that effort put together into a team sport. Striving together. Striving together to win the prize. Joined in one mind. Unified to fight the good warfare. To welcome the help and correction of our brothers and sisters. As we do, Proverbs 18 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Of course, that's not talking about someone who's, who's, who's sick or, or somehow immobilized. It's talking about this person who willfully isolates themselves. And I'm sure Paul's encouragement here is, is in part because the Philippians were facing persecution. We've seen some of that. We've seen that in, when we went through Acts chapter 16. We've seen that Philippi is a dangerous city for Christians to live in. And so these Christians, then they, they need to strive together in unity simply to survive, to, to persevere, to press on together in the face of these external, fearful enemies. But in this call to unity, I, I believe that Paul is also concerned for their purity, their sanctification. Not only that they would uphold Christ as they suffer in public persecution and mockery, but that they would also be blameless and innocent, he'll tell them in chapter 2, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That they would uphold Christ as they gain victory over sin. Not only as they endure persecution, but as they gain victory day by day by the power of the Spirit and in the context of the church over sin. Striving together to hunt down sin. Striving together not to be isolated and to seek our own desires, but to bring sin to light, to root it out of our hearts, and to do so as we hold each other accountable to the Scripture. This is the fight of a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
And Paul wants to see these Philippian Christians understand that their testimony, not only how well they suffer in public, but how they deny themselves and follow Christ in the attitudes of their hearts, in their tenacity to honor Christ by killing sinful habits of pride and selfishness and laziness, how they conduct themselves is for the faith of the gospel. We will fail to do this perfectly. We will fail less when we strive together. In distance running, I think this is my last distance running uh, analogy, but in distance running, it's, it's just known that if you, if you run together, you will perform better than if you run alone. And that, that stretches to all kinds of contexts, but if you have a, a strong rival who's maybe just a little better than you, you will run better. You will be faster. If you have a team running together, they will encourage you and pull you along to run better. And those of us with, with older siblings know that feeling of working just a little harder to try to catch up. And you don't really realize that they're just faster because their bike is four inches taller. But you're still just going to pedal harder to try to catch big brother or big sister. We know that working together on a team uh, at work or um, in groups, it often, it often drives us to produce better results than we would have alone. How much more so in the family, in the household of God. If you're struggling with a sinful habit or with unbelief or with discouragement and you are struggling on your own, you are rejecting one of God's greatest gifts for you. One of the most powerful weapons that we have against sin. Do not struggle alone. Christ's desire for us is not that we would drift in and out alone or that we would come among the body when we feel like we've got things figured out and then when, when we're struggling, we go off on our own to figure things out and come back when we're ready. That's not the pattern. That's not what Paul is commanding these Philippians to do. They are to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And to do so, this is our, our last point, without fear. Verse 28, not frightened, Paul writes, in anything by your opponents. Again, the Philippians know as well as Paul the opposition that they face. Even opposition from the same people, the Romans. Paul is imprisoned by the Romans. They're opposed by the Romans. But Paul isn't just telling them not to fear Romans here. Remember what he just told them back in verse 23. He says that to depart is to be with Christ, which is better. In verses 24 and 25, he says that he knows that remaining will be better for their progress and for their joy. And so he, he's convinced that he won't die yet because Christ will continue to use Paul for his glory. In either case, Paul is unafraid. In verse 20, he will not be at all ashamed or afraid, because if he lives, his suffering, his continued suffering, is for Christ and for Christ's glory. His ministry to the Philippians is for Christ. And if he dies, his race is finished. He gets to go home. He gets to be with Christ. This doesn't make his suffering easy, but he has no fear for the future. No real fear about what anybody can do to him because Christ will hold him fast. Or as Luther wrote in his famous hymn, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Christians don't have to fear. Not in any final way. This doesn't mean that, that, uh, that all kinds of fear are sinful. There's a, a right fear that's good and helpful any mother who's saved her child with lightning-fast reflexes can tell you that there's some kinds of fear that are good, that are a, a gift. But Christians can have confidence. They can have assurance. And interestingly, some of that assurance comes even as we suffer well. Our confidence does not 
uh, does not come from Christ keeping us from suffering, but when, when he gives us the strength to suffer well, when he keeps us through it for his sake. So look at the second half of this verse. It says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction. The them here are the, the Philippians' opponents. So when, when Christians honor Christ, Paul says, even in their suffering, it becomes a clear sign to their oppressors. When Christians buckle under that suffering, when they, when they, when they give in under that persecution, when they don't suffer for Christ's sake, when they, when they give in to, to these fears and, 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 and give in to persecution, they, they vindicate that persecution. They vindicate their, their persecutors. See, you didn't really believe in this stuff anyway. You just needed your feet held over the fire to show that you're really just like all of us. On the other hand, when Christians do suffer and suffer well, they have no need to be afraid because that suffering is an apologetic for the faith. It becomes a clear sign to our oppressors of their own destruction. It shows them clearly that they are not like the people that they are persecuting. That there is something fundamentally and critically different between them and the people who they're trying to harm, and yet who endure it without fear, rejoicing to be counted worthy to suffer for Christ. This is a sign of their destruction, and we can hope that it is a sign which God uses to convict their hearts. So our standing firm, our striving together, our fearlessness, our uh, a sign to our persecutors of their own destruction for their, for their rebellion against God, but it is also for us, Paul writes, a clear sign of your salvation, and that from God. We have this assurance that if we persevere until the end, it is because he has held us in his hands. If we suffer well for the sake of Christ and remember not just in persecution, but in denying ourselves, in taking up our cross daily to follow Christ, in serving our families, in serving the church, giving sacrificially, loving others selflessly, in striving together side by side for the faith, this is his call for you, believers. This is a sign for you of your salvation. Now, is Paul saying here that we're saved by works? To borrow from Paul elsewhere, may it never be. But when we live a life poured out for the gospel, whose, whose greatest aim is to please Christ, to live in a way that honors our true citizenship, not only as a citizen, but as a child in the household of God, and a soldier for his kingdom, we can live without fear, knowing that our faith is a gift from God. Even our suffering is a gift. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. In this way, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy that we have in Christ, for the gift of his body, the church. Your name endures forever. You're renowned through all ages. Your word says that you will vindicate your people and have compassion on your servants. And we pray that you would strengthen us to be faithful servants, even in trouble. Give us boldness to conduct ourselves as citizens of your kingdom. In a, even in the midst of a strange, a hostile land. Empower us to strive in unity and to be unafraid, to refute what is false, to hate sin, to pursue righteousness, 
and to love your people. Let all of our service, our work, our words, our prayer be pleasing in your sight and give you glory. Take our lives, Lord, and let them be consecrated to your service. In Jesus' name, amen.